Hello, good morning, uh, afternoon, or evening, everyone. On behalf of the National Human Genome Research Institute, I'd like to welcome you to the 14th roughly annual genomic medicine meeting, uh, this time on genomic learning healthcare systems. I'm Terry Manolio of the Division of Genomic Medicine here at NHGRI, uh, and we're showing on the screen the first day's agenda, and then, thank you, um, and then if you could go on <clears throat> to the uh, objectives, the goal and objectives for the meeting, uh, these are all in the meeting booklet, and there's actually a wealth of information in there, uh, including short bios of all the speakers, um, so in the interest of time, we'll just ask our moderators to introduce the presenters and panelists by name uh, as shown in the agenda, but you can click on the agenda and it will take you right to the bio. There's also some background information in there, which uh, hopefully you've, you've taken a look at before we get started. There's a list of attendees uh, and you'll note it includes registrants from Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the Far East. So welcome to you all. Um, we're looking forward to an exciting two days. I'd also like to uh, start by extending our sincere thanks to six of the many people who are actually making this whole thing work. Um, Teji Rapra Burris and Pamela Williams from Duke University. Uh, Janavi Narula and Ellis Sommer from my group, uh, who are our rapporteurs for the session, uh, and Alvaro Encinas and um, Gerald Samani, along with their colleagues from our IT group, uh, who make all the IT and, and recording magic kind of happen. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to our co-chair, Pat DeVerco, who's Senior Vice President at Veronex Solutions, to get us started. Pat? Thanks, Terry. Um, let me just go ahead and share my screen here. So um, as, it, as Terry mentioned, and in the, we have very clear objectives for this meeting, and what we thought was important was that we track progress that we've made since a meeting that was held uh, in 2015 about genomics enabled learning healthcare systems. Um, it was sponsored by the Roundtable on Translating Genomic-Based Research for Health. And at that time, the co-chairs of this Roundtable were Sharon Terry uh, and Jeff Ginsburg. Um, and I know Jeff is gonna be participating um, here later uh, in the program. So I thought it would be good to ground our work and sort of what, what were the thoughts then uh, and Let's see if we can track progress since then. So these were the workshop objectives. Um, it was to really explore how key pieces of genetic or genomic information could be effectively and efficiently delivered to patients and clinicians for improving care. And how the, both the healthcare system and genomic data can be used for evidence generation in research and patient care and to assess best practices in for using knowledge generating learning healthcare system and which models um, could provide an opportunity for genomics to be used in the rapid learning process. So very ambitious goals and clearly directly related to the goals that we have as well for this meeting. And so they had a series of questions to facilitate the uh, workshop discussion. And it was really how can health systems engage individuals to achieve health using genomic and other technologies? And how can systems providers and patients learn from failed efforts so that we can continuously improve health and treatments? And how can genomic data be used to support patient-centered care? And how can health systems help research and care teams have access to all of the data? So again, very comprehensive, very broad, uh, thinking about a genomics learning healthcare system. Um, so what were the themes from the meeting? And so this, you know, there was a very uh, nice summary. It was provided to you in the booklet. You also were provided the link to the full report. So this is a very sort of high level, uh, sort of what did, uh, what did the groups uh, determine? And they thought that genomic learning healthcare systems definitely had the potential to improve population health, solve care management problems, and develop uh, effective implementation practices. So clearly focus on clinical care <clears throat> and care delivery, but also could be used to support discovery research, looking for associations between genotype and phenotype. But that all of the, the positive benefits of a genomic learning healthcare system were really impeded by the lack of high quality, accessible, interoperable genomic data in the EHR. And 
uh, clearly there was a need for, for that problem to be overcome. There was a need to, to develop data standards and as well as scalable clinical decision support systems. It was also recognized that it was really important to engage patients to understand their preferences regarding data uses and how the genomic learning healthcare system broadly would be communicated to the public because it was uh, discussed that we clearly needed processes to ensure a trustworthy uh, system. And so topics such as informed consent, confidentiality, data security were all topics that were touched upon. And then um, this is a little bit of editorializing on my part. I, I've worked deeply in the area of trying to develop evidence of clinical utility for, gen, uh, for genomic interventions, meaning specifically that use of a genomic intervention would lead to a change in provider and patient behavior, and that behavior change would lead to an improvement in health outcomes. Um, and so there was a recognition that that sort of chain of evidence that is ideal um, was lacking. And because of that, I mean, it's all obviously important for clinical practice, but it's also very important to get payer reimbursement as clinical utility is a an evidence threshold that payers look to but in order to provide coverage for the genomic intervention. Um, and uh, there was some, but I would say a much more limited mention of things like health disparities and the need for social science and behavioral research as part of next steps in terms of implementation. And then it's just worth pointing out that the really the whole conversation is was very US focused. And so what they uh, proposed as next steps, and I think this is kind of a launch uh, pad for us, uh, all the steps to improve the IT infrastructure are really critical. I've touched upon things like data standards and how you need to be able to support um, clinical decision support systems. So such that we, you have confidence that the algorithms being used are valid and that these tools could be shared. Um, there was a, a, a series of next steps around encouraging or incentivizing data sharing and a real emphasis on the role of the patients and patient provided data and how we could integrate that patient provided data into the healthcare information technology systems as well as the typical clinical data. And then obviously a need to measure health outcomes and do it by engaging stakeholders who all have a vested interest in the results. So getting their perspective in developing studies that would be relevant for clinical impaired decision-making. And that um, there was uh, a mention that it was important going forward to track health and healthcare disparities and to be able to try to understand the priorities and values of patients and providers by using um, uh, social science and behavioral research methods. So I'll just close, and uh, this was the last quotation, um, quoting uh, Jeff Ginsburg about how things were left. Uh, and th the close is that we should really be thinking about how we can begin to build this system that's going to support genomics-enabled healthcare. So in 2015, we were thinking of beginning to build it. And I think what you're gonna be hearing for the next two days is how much progress has been made. There's quite, a, I'm very excited to see the presentations and hear the discussion because I think there has been quite a bit of progress, but this um, 2015 meeting was a great first step. Okay. So I think I am also going to be introducing, or you're going to go through the goals and objectives, Terry? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, um, so let me, um, actually, I, I pulled them down, um, but I'll, I'll do them at the end. Um, so, so great. And let me just do this and this, and you should be seeing a full presenter view. Does that look about right, Pat? Yeah, it looks good on my screen. Okay, super. Um, great, and thank you very much, Pat, for for bringing us, you know, um, kind of up to date with uh, the 2015 meeting and and what the goals were there. I, I saw a comment from Sharon Terry, uh, who's who's in the um, uh, attendees, and so perhaps uh, during the discussion we can ask her uh, and and Jeff, uh, who chaired that okay. meeting, to you know make some make some comments about it. Um, I just wanted to to talk a, a little bit about these meetings in general. As I mentioned before, this is our 14th. Um, these are organized by the Genomic Medicine Working Group of our National Advisory uh, Council on Human Genome Research. Uh, and um, these the members of the group, many of them are, are current or former measures, members of our advisory council. And you can see the list of them here. Uh, and then there are several uh, of us from NHGRI who follow their lead. 
Um, and just showing you here the, the plethora of meetings that this group has uh, organized and, and led, um, several of them leading to uh, uh, published papers. And uh, this was, you know, I sort of ran out of room, so I've added on two more. Uh, the most recent one was in February of 2021. You'll hear a little bit about that from Ken Wiley a little later uh, today. Uh, and then, of course, this one on genomic learning healthcare systems. Just to give you a feel for the kinds of outcomes from these meetings. Our very first meeting was in Chicago in 2011. Uh, we basically just uh, identified as many people as we knew uh, who were doing what we would consider to be implementation of broader scale genomics, you know, beyond just one or, or two genes in that in clinical care. Uh, from that came a, a subsequent meeting we called ClinAction, uh, looking at, at developing um, uh, agreement on how to interpret and apply variants. That led to the Clinical Genome Resource, which is one of our largest and most broadly spanning programs involving over a thousand investigators. Uh, around the world, um, and they've most recently uh, published a paper on the Gene Curation Coalition, which is a, a bringing together of 12 um, uh, major groups that are doing this kind of curation. Uh, so, so lots of things to come, uh, as well as have already come from, from that. Also from the first meeting in our Electronic Medical Records and Genomics program, uh, we implemented a pharmacogenetics uh, testing platform and uh, returned uh, those results. As well, uh, we held a second meeting on uh, recognizing that we needed to develop collaborations. From that came the Implementing Genomics in Practice Program, or IGNITE. Uh, I can't show you all of them, but just a, a few selected ones from the fourth meeting on educating uh, healthcare practitioners. Um, we, we developed the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee on Practitioner Education in Genomics, or ISCC. Um, the sixth one was on global leaders in genomic medicine. So basically the same kind of format that we had done for our very first meeting, which was purely domestic US, uh, except we invited folks from all around the world, several of you whom are registered for the meeting today, which is great. Uh, that then led to um, starting the genomic, uh, Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative and its, its subsequent uh, program, the International 100,000 Cohorts Consortium, which is uh, a, a consortium, as you might imagine, of 100,000 plus uh, individuals you know, per cohort, although some many of the cohorts are smaller, uh, uh, focusing on genetics, but also uh, addressing a, a number of, of different things. Um, the eighth meeting um, was a, an overview of, of our major programs. It led to a, a, a series of um, uh, efforts in developing modules in genomic medicine that are, are uh, being made available to the, the uh, scientific and clinical communities for use in, in education of providers. Our ninth meeting on um, um, <clears throat> sort of linking basic scientists and uh, clinicians uh, led to a, a very successful program announcement uh, led primarily by our sister division, uh, the Division of Genomic Sciences on Variance Function and, and Disease. Um, our 10th meeting on pharmacogenetics um, uh, led the IGNITE program in its next iteration to begin a, a, a large-scale trial of pharmacogenetics called ADOPT, uh, which is, is looking at three different interventions. Uh, our 11th meeting on implementation uh, led to a, a discussion among employers uh, on, on how to use genomics in their health systems, which is something that's still sort of uh, incubating, as it were. Our 12th meeting on, on polygenic risk um, led to incorporation of genomic risk assessment into the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, or the Emerge Network, as well as uh, a new program um, uh, started by my colleague, uh, Lucia Hindorf, and now led by, by um, Ken Wiley uh, in our division um, called the Primed Consortium, which is looking um, uh, primarily at polygenic risk uh, methods development in diverse populations. Um, and our 13th meeting, which as I mentioned, you'll hear more about, uh, was um, uh, led to a, a notice for requesting applications basically in patient-centered informatics tools. So lots of things come out of this meeting and we're expecting uh, these meetings and expecting this one to be no exception. 
Um, the, the structure of these meetings is, is typically what you see. We've in the past have done them in person. We, we were a little bit shaky about whether we'd be able to do this one in person given changing rates and that sort of thing. So we, we sort of punted and, and went uh, virtual and um, uh, hopefully our, our next ones will be able to be in person. But at any rate, um, we focus on, on really trying to build a community around uh, genomic medicine research and implementation as well as collaborations in that. Um, and I would note just during this meeting, you know, one of the nice things about meeting in person is you can lean over to the person next to you or, you know, at coffee or whatever and, and make a comment. Um, so to allow that, we've enabled the chat function. Um, but however, however, we really ask that if you have a point that you want to raise for discussion, please try to put it in the Q&A box rather than the chat, because we'll be watching closely the Q&A box. We'll try to watch the chat, but if we don't get to it, we will have those stored. And if we can get back to you, we will try to do that. Um, uh, another goal of this, this meeting, which I'll go over in a second, is, is to identify research directions, not just for NHGRI, but for the scientific community at large. Uh, and we and others can then um, um, potentially consider and fund uh, programs that might be initiated by a single investigator or a group of investigators or, or by our institute or other institutes. We try in these meetings to emphasize discussion um, because we really, you know, if we all we wanted to do was just to have people talking at each other, um, we wouldn't need to bring you all together at the same time. Um, so we're trying to arrive at the at the end of a session, at the end of, of a day, uh, at, at what we all know together, uh, rather than what each of us knows individually. We've assigned a member of the Genomic Medicine Working Group as a co-moderator for each session, and they are paired with experts um, from the, the scientific community um, for uh, moderating. Uh, and uh, for all of these meetings, if it's warranted, if, if there's enough new information, uh, we produce a white paper for peer-reviewed publication on both the findings and uh, future directions of the uh, uh, of the research in that particular area, we would hope to do that here if if it's warranted. And and typically the authors of of those are the moderators and presenters and panelists. So so that you're aware of that. And then as as Pat mentioned, these again are the goals uh, and objectives of the program to uh, discuss progress and identify solutions and really emphasize the solutions. Uh, we'll we'll talk very briefly after Peter Kulik's um, uh, talk about bar <clears throat> barriers, but honestly, you know, having been doing this for the past 10 or 11 years or so, we hear a lot about barriers. So, and they're pretty much the same barriers. Um, you know, some of them have been resolved, but but many of them have not or not fully. Um, so let's try to get away from, you know, worrying about the barriers and really try to focus on what are the solutions that people have come up with? How can those be shared and what collaborations can be formed uh, 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 about them? So we'll be exploring some real world examples of how genomic learning healthcare systems apply the virtuous cycle is, that you can see on the left here of implementation, evaluation, adjustment, and updated implementation across various delivery systems. We will look at a few barriers just to mention them um, and identify potential solutions with a focus on the lessons learned from effective genomic learning healthcare systems and uh, especially their potential transportability in, into other settings. And then determine some ways that solutions can be developed and shared and importantly, collaborations can be formed to facilitate research uh, on implementation of genomic learning healthcare systems. So with that, I will stop sharing. And I think, Pat, I turn it back over to you now to introduce our moderators for session one. <laughs>